Okay, let's talk about naming ionic compounds. Ionic and covalent. And then doing the Lewis dot, Vesper, all of that. Okay, so for this, I'm going to pick an ionic compound and a covalent. My prime example over here is going to be NaCl, and my prime example over here is going to be H2O. So I've already said that this is ionic because it has a metal and a nonmetal. I know that hydrogen is a nonmetal, oxygen is a nonmetal, so this is a covalent bond. When I'm naming an ionic compound, I just give it its name, no prefixes. So I'm going to call this one sodium chloride. If this metal was a transition metal, so let's do like a little thought bubble. So if it was a transition metal, I would have to say it's charge in Roman numerals. Okay, so this one is giving the chlorine a one charge. So if sodium was a tr transition metal, it's not. But if it was, I would say I had sodium one chloride. Okay, so it's not a transition metal, but if it was, it would be sodium one chloride. So that's how I name ionic compounds, no prefixes. Over here at covalent, it's the opposite. I'm gonna give it a prefix. So I start off, I have two hydrogens, so I give my first one a prefix, dihydrogen monoxide. I always give my second one a prefix. So I've named now covalent bond, dihydrogen monoxide, um, because I had two hydrogens and one oxygen. So you will have your chart about how to, um, which prefixes to use, and you'll have your polyatomic ion sheet. Remember that for polyatomic ions, you have three or more um, atoms. So if I had Na2, SO4. That would still be an ionic compound. I'm just going to have sodium. I see that I have three atoms, so I have sodium sulfate. So this is sulfate. Okay, so those are a couple of little tricks. If you have three or more, it's polyatomic. Use your polyatomic ion sheet. If it's a transition metal, make sure you give it a Roman numeral. Okay, so over here, sodium chloride, I do not do Vesper. I don't do Lewis dot for the whole compound when it comes to ionic. I can do Lewis dot for each of those, so I'll have sodium and chloride. And you see why they go so well together. This sodium is just going to donate its electron to chlorine so that it'll have a full valence shell, and this will have a full valence shell. So that's the only Lewis dot structure that you would maybe need to show me for ionic. Over here with covalent, things are a little bit different. So I have my dihydrogen monoxide. And I know that I need to make these connections. So covalent, share. So I need to show that my electrons are being shared. Okay. I First of all, I want to find the number of valence electrons. Using your periodic table, you will find that oxygen has above it, it says 6A. So oxygen has six electrons, valence electrons. Hydrogen has one electron. I have one oxygen and two hydrogens. So I have eight valence electrons total that are going to be shared. My next step is I'm going to put oxygen in the middle and make it bond with hydrogen. Start off with single bonds always. My hydrogen is full because it can only have two electrons. My oxygen is going to bond to form the octet rule. So it wants eight electrons to be full. All right, so that's the octet rule. That's why all of these things bond. Even over here, you see that chlorine gets eight and sodium will go back to its regular, um, its next full valence shell, which is eight as well. So things are bonding to fill the octet rule. That's the similarity that these have. So my oxygen wants eight. Right now, I'm showing that it has four, right? I count each of these bonds as two. So it's two, four, I have eight electrons to place, so now I'm gonna start putting my lone pairs of electrons. Like I said, my hydrogen is full, so I'll just put them on oxygen. This is my Lewis dot structure. 
If I want to look at my Vesper model, I can draw it a little bit like this. I see that it is making two bonds. So my central atom is making two bonds. So it's connecting to a hydrogen and another hydrogen. So I have two bonds, two valence pairs of electrons. So this is tetrahedral and bent. You will get your chart on your quiz or your test tomorrow. So just make sure that you understand how to use it. You're looking for two and two that gets you tetrahedral and bent. So this is its Vesper. The last thing that you'll need to know on your test is polarity. Any time that you have these unpaired electrons, it's going to be polar. Okay, so for this water molecule, we have these unpaired electrons, so it's going to be polar. If you weren't sure about that, you draw your arrows going in towards your more electronegative element. So in this case, we know that oxygen wants electrons more. It's more electronegative. And that fits the trend of electronegativity going from left to right and increasing. So just follow that trend. Make sure you're following that trend. Um, these will balance out. And then these electrons go out into space. So there's nothing to push them back. That makes them polar. So anytime you have these unpaired electrons, they're just going out into space. They're not getting pushed back, and that's going to make them polar. All right, so those are the things that you'll need to know for your test tomorrow. Polarity, the Vesper model, and how to use your chart. Um, how to make this Lewis dot diagram, so figuring out how many valence electrons it has. And then naming. Okay?